Squat, scorn, scorn, the 2023 Rugby World Cup final is just one more sleepless night away. After four years of plotting, eight weeks of playing and seven days of fretting, the All Blacks take on the Springboks this Saturday in the Stade de France for the biggest prize in the entire sport. It all comes down to this. So to dig into what we might see, how other team might play and where the World Cup will be won, I sat down with channel co-person Will to begin with the fixture itself. The thing is, right, there's a lot of people out there saying, oh, it's a boring final that we've got these two teams who've won it three times each. They're each looking for their fourth title. That's a boring outcome for rugby. The thing is, right, of every game in this entire tournament, this is the match out of all 48 that I am least confident calling how it's going to go. Yeah, yeah. This is the game which I feel like I have the least possible like ability to predict it. And so thank you for tuning in to watch this. <laughs> but I mean, before we go into specifics mm. of it, I just think New Zealand versus South Africa is such a like an iconic rugby fixture. When certainly when we first got into rugby, I think it's the case for a lot of people when you first get into rugby, those are the two teams that you're always told these are the best two teams in the world, New yeah. Zealand and South Africa. And for that to then be the final, I think is really poetic. You know, the last time these two faced each other in the final, the only time they faced each other in the final is in 1995. And we all remember how that went. That is maybe the most iconic and well-remembered rugby game of all time. Probably the most famous rugby game globally that's ever happened. How great that we get a repeat of that. This will be the 106th game between New Zealand and South Africa. Over that time, New Zealand have won 62, South Africa have won 39, and there have been four draws. It's basically a kind of 60-40 split, you know, percentage-wise between the two. And yet it's always remained pretty even. It's the great rivalry in all of rugby. On paper, like on the surface, mm. you look at these te two teams and you see a real contrast in the way that they play. Yeah. But both of them are extremely defined in what they do. I say on paper and on the surface for, for the reason being it's very easy to underplay the All Blacks pack. You know, their scrum and their maul have probably been their biggest strengths pound for pound at this World Cup, that they've bullied oppositions in those areas. It's easy to look at New Zealand and kind of make the assumption that they haven't kicked the ball, that they haven't kept the tight because they've scored such flashy tries where they have played wide to wide or whatever. But no, actually, they've bullied people up front. They have been yeah. a really physical pack to play against. New Zealand are one of the teams that's kicked the ball the most in this World Cup. Yeah. Um, and they've changed how they kick the every highest. single game. Yeah. And that's the thing, right? New Zealand and South Africa are fundamentally very different teams, right? If you look at the kind of the, the brand they're putting out there to the world, they're very different sides. And yet, right, if you're to dig down into it, they're doing largely the same things and they're coming from largely similar places. They're just finding different kind of, it's like they're putting different accents on the same speech. But yes, yeah, so you've got both of them really built on their pack, both of them really built on their mall. They probably have the two best scrums in the competition i think these are the two best scrums in the tournament going up against each other the two most dominant again it's something i talked about in the previous ones but when you listen to italy and uruguay and the other teams that had to play them in the pool stage they all talked about the thing they really worried about was the scrum was how dominant the all black scrum is and the only team that's really contained them there was france in the opening game but likewise it was england last week was the only team that's really contained south africa at scrum time and even then they until to do that came for, exactly until cole went off um, yeah, that's and it was it. only for a limited period. Uh, they have named their team, where the All Blacks haven't as we're recording this. And South Africa have gone for a 7-1 split on the bench. That really changes this game as a prospect. Yeah, massively. I think one of the big talking points on the bench is Trevor Nayakani coming in instead of Vincent mm. Koch. What has been stated is that Vincent Koch couldn't train on Monday and they have a selection policy where if you can't train on Monday, you're not available to yeah. play on the Saturday. Trevor Nayakani, uh, I have Jared Wright to thank for this wonderful stat that is now magically appearing on the screen, which is that Trevor Nayakani, this would be his 49th game off the bench for South Africa. Wow. The only player who's come off the bench more, for, more than South Africa for him is Stephen Kitchoff. Wow, okay. Which says a lot about how Razi Erasmus likes to use, you know, destructive scrummages off the bench. Mm. And also says a lot about, you know, Tendai and Tauriru and Franz Myherba being the best scrummaging props of their generation. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, right, Trevor Nakani got injured in the opening game in 2019, got his winner's medal in the end, but didn't get to play any part in the rest of that tournament. There's some unfinished business there. And you look at the damage he did on the Lions tour when he was massive. I mean, he's always massive. Uh, the other <laughs> thing about Trevor Nakani is he loves to dance. Loves and to if dance. Africa do win this tournament, there will be a dance and a half to come. So that's technical answer you come for is what players might dance on the full-time whistle. But no, so you go back and you look at those two semifinals, right? And one of them was very close. The other one was not. There's been some talk of whether this will have wiped South Africa out. It will have emptied the tank. The fact that it's going through two such physical, such tight games, won both the semi and the quarter by a point, a single point. That 7-1 bench, I think, is really interesting on that front in that South Africa have rotated their squad better than any other team in this tournament. 
right? They have. You look at the minutes every single player in that team's played, they are pretty similar. Like, even Etzebeth has started most of the games, but he's only played, like, he only played 45 minutes last week, 46 minutes. Again, he came off, you know, in the couple of pool games, came up against Ireland. They are really managing that starting 15 minutes. Like, not many of them have played that much. All the All Blacks players, probably to a man, have from the starting 15, have probably played more minutes than the South African counterpart. And so the fact that they're coming up against this kind of physical run of games, you question whether actually are they really well conditioned? This was something I worried about Ireland was that they would run out of steam. And I don't think that's quite what happened, but I think you saw a level of that. There was a level of fatigue. And I don't think that was the only thing that lost in the game. But I think that was like maybe a 5% of an overall thing and they were maybe 10% off winning. So maybe that wasn't a factor. But Ireland kept basically the same starting 15 for every game, including the Tonga game, including the Romania game. And they're playing a really strong team. So yeah. Africa have really varied it, really torn their team up. New Zealand, on the other hand, they played a very changed team against Namibia and at points against Uruguay, but they still picked a pretty strong team against Uruguay and a very strong team against Italy. So it's weird. It's hard to say how fatigued or otherwise New Zealand might be coming into this game. You talk about Ibn Tibet and the fact he has come off in these games and he's going to on Saturday, right? Because hmm. they've got both Ahis Neyman and... Uh, John Klein on the bench, which is a really interesting one because John Klein hasn't played in the knockouts yet, mm. but he is the, he's... the first Irish international to ever play beyond quarterfinals. Absolutely, yeah, very true. But he is built for those sorts of occasions. Like one, yeah. the URC with Munster was unbelievable all season, an unbelievable carrier, really just reliable at set piece. Like when those as well. when those battle stats start to go down from Etzebet, because he's going to be psychotic for 45 look, yeah. minutes because he's given a license to do so you look at that Ireland game he packs absolutely every ounce of annoyingness into those 45 or 50 odd minutes that yeah. he played in that game uh and same last week like last week was arguably Ebenezer like quietest game in a long time but that doesn't say much you know mm. because he's been unbelievable he's possibly the best player in the world right now yeah well the interesting thing about South Africa right is that they are the only team coached by a qualified rugby medic. Yeah. Like, nine of his background was as a as an SNC guy and as a medical doctor, as a kind of trained medical professional on the sidelines. Like, he is from a very different background, and I think you've seen that come into the Springboks. They've managed their minutes so much better than he did four years ago, yeah. where they were playing a largely strong team, and they just had a really strong bench that could come on and keep them fresh in every single game. And here they've been like, no, we're going we're gonna to start from the off, and we're going to be a very different prospect. But that plays into the whole battle stats thing. Mm. You know, as soon as somebody's GPS starts flagging and they're going like, okay, we, for instance, Sia Khaleesi, you know, 50 odd minutes into a game, they usually go, okay, Sia's effort level is 10% mm. lower than it was two minutes ago. Now we're going to get put somebody fresh on who is completely fine. Usually at this point being Dion Ferry, who is yeah. in theory the replacement hooker, but thanks to Umbanambi's ability to just rough it and go, do 80 whole minutes and play exceptionally well for 80 whole minutes, like the, that man is unbelievably fit. It frees up an extra space in that pack with that, yeah. you know, now 7 1 bench coming on. That there's a very strong possibility that Umbanambi is the one player who lasts the full 80 in that South African pack in this game. And yeah. the other interesting thing with 7 1 that is always made a lot of is. Obviously, what happens if someone gets injured? Instead of putting Corbus Reinach on the bench with Fafta Plot coming in to start, mm. they've gone with Vili LaRue. Yes. So covering Scrum off will presumably be Cheslin Colby. Cheslin Colby. Nine of us said this in the press conference. Okay. He said he so. Sevens at nine. And yes. that was his full time position when he was a sevens yep. player, which was like that was a two or three year period. Well, but that was also about seven or eight years ago. He said that, yeah, he's so already played sweeper in sevens. So he's got mm. experience there. And he said for several years, he's been our player who, if the scrum off got Simbind, will come in and play nine. Okay. So they have been practicing over a few years of him playing nine occasionally so that he's just got some experience of the calls and he knows them all roughly, just because he always wants to have that as a fresh option. So he just have some experience there. But this is a literal World Cup final. This is the yeah. biggest game you can play in as a professional rugby player. That's the thing. Like, Razi and Jack have clearly trained really well for this, like, mm. they've prepared really well for this. But you almost wonder could they have done with giving him a start there? If they knew, like Ooh. in a warm game or something, no, not in the game like this, obviously. Or giving him 10 minutes off the bench there, just in case. Exactly. Just yeah. so he is trained there. Because if Fafta Kluck gets injured two minutes in, and I really hope he doesn't, yeah. Uh, but if that happens, because it has happened before, he's going to have to manage an entire World Cup final as a scrum half where he has not started a game professionally. 
But this is the thing, isn't it, right? If you're going to win a World Cup, it's going to take a level of boldness and taking risks. Absolutely. And they have gone, okay, our best chance is if we have a fresh pack coming on and we can really take it to them. And take the fact that their scrum and their maul has been such a big factor for the All Blacks. If we can take that away from them for the first time in this tournament. Well, no, the only other time it's happened in this tournament was the one game they lost in that opening match. And it could be a fitting way for them to begin and end in the Stade de France, losing games on both nights. But, 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 you have taken a massive risk in that. And I do want to pick up on the choice they have made, right? Which is Billy the Rue coming in. Because he is close to being, for the backs and for the attack, what the bomb squad is for their pack, in that he can completely revitalize and change them as a prospect in attack. So I had a look back over that game between New Zealand and Argentina this morning. Don't tell Bill Beaumont. Don't let him know. Don't let him know any of this. You watch rugby? How dare yeah, you? I don't let him know. So there's only really one passage in which LaRue comes to the fore in that second half against England. But there's one passage where he slots in, he starts playing 10 every phase or a lot of phases, and England continue watching Pollard, and he is coming in, he's running the attack in that way I've talked about so many times over the last how many of the years of how good Billy LaRue is, how bloody good he is at running an attack, at picking his runners, at bringing pace and you know dynamism to an attack and changing the prospect of the defence constantly. He's such a good player at that, and so good as a second playmaker to come in and you know run shapes and call stuff and allow Pollard to just sit there and focus on the Or time even as a first field. playmaker. So there's one period where they really got on top and eventually they lose the ball, but they make about 30 metres downfield just from LaRue over five faces, organising the attack incredibly well. What we did see is LaRue coming in a big playmaker there. We've seen him do it countless times down the years. Obviously, when they played in the European Championship earlier this year, LaRue really managed the Springboks first try of the game for Colby, where he comes in and throws an incredible pass at the end, having really managed the sequence of phases in the lead-up. We talked about in the video on that, which is still up if you want to see it. World Rugby haven't taken it down. However, what we also saw in the other semi-final between New Zealand and Argentina was just how much the Kiwi defence is focused on playmakers, right? And this was something that when I was watching in the stands was really obvious to me at the time. And then when I went to watch it back, I was like, oh, this doesn't seem to be the case. And then you start looking in detail at New Zealand defending, like, oh, no, they are. They're, they're really just marking up on Carreras, right? Because Argentina went into that game with only one playmaking option. Neither of their centres were really that second 5'8 type player. Likewise, you know, uh, Cruz Mali is a converted centre at full back. Feli has played 10, but like, come on, guys, on the wing. They didn't really have a second playmaking option. So everything was coming off Carreras, who even then is a winger. Yeah. And it meant it was really easy for the All Blacks to mark up. And it was something that felt quite obvious in the stands watching the period early on. So the Argentina in the first half, they win the kickoff and then they have long sequence phases in which they're doing all right, but they're basically making losing the same five metres over and over again. Because what Argentina do is they like to get to an edge and then play off that, right? And that means you can play off one playmaker because you don't have two options either side. And a handful of times that we saw Carreras take Sunny on the short side, all they did was set a pod on the other side because he didn't have someone else to come in and organize properly or to run things or to sit in the boot. There'd be no one sat behind. So it was completely unthreatening to New Zealand defense. All you know you've got to do is make a straight up tackle on one of three men. You don't need to watch the rest because Carreras is managing everything else. And if you can put pressure on him, everything shuts down because everything is coming from him purely, right? South Africa will probably be like that in the first half. they will probably be a similar prospect to what Argentina were defensively, except they're far more physical. They're far more like able to cross the game line and smash you backwards. And they're far more likely to take drop goals or find three points and find ways to eke that out. And just really streetwise in the ways they can buy three points from a referee as well. What we may see in the second half is the South African attack change entirely. We may see them start to try and split the field far more. You look at the tries New Zealand conceded in this World Cup, right? Against France, the most dangerous attacks that France ran against them were from split positions in the middle of the field, where they split the two teams apart. So there's a try Peno scored in that opening game where they just split the field open. They have two sides running and they're able to manage things on both sides. And New Zealand defence is much better when it's one straight line from a touchline than it is from midfield positions, right? It used to be before they changed the coaching staff, you could really attack them by attacking around the rock and being really narrow. Now they've spread out, they've got that very much down. But again, you look back at uh, Australia in the rugby championship, the closest anyone's come other than France to beating the All Blacks this year. Large part of that was them attacking down blind sides, was them finding space on blind sides through Narangu to Nasse, through the likes of Tom Hooper. The All Black defence is really good at numbering up and pushing front and then pushing out. That becomes a much more difficult prospect when you have to do it twice at the same time. So what we may see, my gut instinct, is South Africa being very direct in the first half, and then LaRue comes on, and suddenly with two playmakers, with two guys managing the attack, they can manage completely different shapes on either side and start running to play wider and play different positions and be splitting the field and trying to split the Kiwi defence into two defences rather than having one unified unit, which is when they're at their best. You say that that was the closest anyone came to beating the All Blacks this year. Of course, the Springboks beat them at Twickenham as well. 
Of which, course, sorry. Yes. Is it, it, you know, it's a huge statement ahead of this. And I'm going to get on to what you were just saying there. But like, mm. bear in mind in 2019, South Africa arranged that fixture with Japan so yeah. to give themselves the mental boost knowing that they could play him eventually in the quarterfinal. I wonder if that was a part of like them agreeing to that game at Twickenham is being in the Northern Hemisphere, beating the All yeah. Blacks as a reminder, like, no, we're asserting our dominance here. We're, we're the better team here. But yes, well, what you were just saying there about LaRue, do you then think, so if they're going to play slightly more expansively in the second half, do you think that their bench pack is tailored towards that? Would you say that the likes of Dion Fury, who are in the good in the loose, are his name and great carrier and offloader and so on, do you think that that's a deliberate selection? Not just looking at the scrum, but also the attack? I think that's very possible. So Hodge Simon speaks for himself as a carrying offloading threat. We saw it last week. We saw him coming on the score in the try as well. But the really and interesting Ireland, name... Much the same. Yeah. Really interesting name on that bench, right, is Jasper Visa, a man we haven't seen at all in the knockouts. And he looked in the pool stage like he is the Springbok 8 now. You know, he's displacing Vermeulen. And it comes to crunch time and they go, no, Vermeulen organizes the defense. He's so vital. He's so good under the high ball, crucially as well, which I think is another big element of it, that they brought him in and they put him in because they trust him, you know, and he's kind of an extra coach on the field as well. He's literally been in the coach's box in this World Cup. However, Jasper Visa is a far more dynamic carrying threat. He's a far bigger carrier. He will make you more meat. I bet, you know, I haven't got the stats in front of it, but he's like meters per carrier significantly better than Vermeulen's. Yeah, I reckon they probably are. I reckon the only guy who probably rivals him for that, arguably in the World Cup, would be Quaker Smith, who's also on the bench. Or, or Ardi Surveyor. Or Ardi Surveyor. And that's going to be some battle between those guys as well. Another thing that I want to bring up, okay, so the mm-hmm. last World Cup final, South Africa kicked a lot in the first half, they were very physical in the second half, like, you know, kept it very tight in the second half and then eventually just ground England down, right? Mm. So we saw them bring out that move where they hit, hit us in midfield yes. in the first phase. Then the second phase, they set up an entire mall, like a, basically a scrum formation on the blind side mm. with their entire pack and a preset mall, right? Do you think they have something like this up their sleeves again? Ab- because Razi Rasmus always does something up his sleeve. Absolutely. The scrum from the marks are close we've come in this World Cup, I think. Yes. That was a huge thing. I think they definitely do. So infamously, it's in Chasing the Sun. That move, they only practiced in the hotel. So they were hiring up meeting rooms in the hotel, moving all the tables to the side and practicing it because they didn't want any. They didn't want to be the chance of anyone seeing it run on the training field, just in case someone was passing by, just in case there was some sort of spy, whatever. I wonder if they've hired out entire like swimming pools at the hotel they're staying in in order to run full set moves. So we saw France do this once in the Six Nations. It's something I wonder whether it's going to come up. And I don't wonder if we just didn't get the chance to see it, that they were kicking in order and then targeting the following phase and looking to run strike moves off the opposition ball. Looking at the opposition recover, they rock over, they win the ball back, they attack from there, right? Uh, we then saw England were the first team to do it since. They had that pre-run move that's in the video that went up the other day on the drop goal, the foul drop goal, was off South African possession. And that was the goal. That was the idea. It was a kick to someone isolated, rocked over, cleared out, and then hit to Farrell in the pocket for the drop goal. Brilliant, genius stuff, right? Razzie will have looked over that and worked out that was pre-planned. And I wonder if they had those similar sort of things in the locker already. Or I wonder if that's something they're going to pull out. Equally, I just think they will have something that we can't possibly see coming. I think there'll be something at some point that will be genius and smart and small, but probably worth points. Right. Like his point with the mall move, the move, as they called it, was just he wanted something in the locker that could guarantee them three points. And so if there's a dangerous point in the game where the game's starting to come back to them and it wasn't to do early on, it was to be later in the game. If England started to get momentum, it was to pull that move out and time it right. And so you've got on Chasing the Sun, him as a setting for that one line out. England just scored points, but, you know, Leroux puts a lovely kick in and they get a line out just outside the 22. And is Razzie calling the move now, you know, as run is now? And kills their momentum. Mpimpi scores shortly afterwards. Changes the game. And I bet, I bet they've got something else he's been working for four years. Going, well, we need something else similar just in case that can guarantee us three points. You know, it isn't a try move. It isn't something looking to blow down the All Black defence in particular, which is another interesting prospect. But it's something I bet he's been thinking of ever since that mall move. Is what do we do in four years' time for the next one? And one of the big things that's changed about rugby in the last four years is tap penalty moves are back now. Yeah. You know, forwards tapping off the floor and passing to each other. All that sort of stuff has come back into the game. And you just know that Razzie has some kind of version of that that just boils down to, let's give it to our big lad and get him to run into somebody, right? Yeah. So which team popularised those moves coming back? Uh, Leinster. Leinster. Where's Jacques Nineberg going to be coaching next week? Leinster. 
yeah, I wonder if there's some sort of <laughs> playbook that he's pulling from or anything he's been looking at or going, this is what my job's going to be in two weeks' time. Let's get ahead of the curve here. I don't know. That is a really good point. He might be messaging Leo Cullen and going like, just a heads up, just for my job when I get there because I want to be well prepared. Uh, what moves are we planning on running this season? Can I just have a copy of the whole playbook, preferably right before we play Ireland, please? Yeah. Yeah, my gut feeling South Africa will play more in the second half. Well, they don't need LeBoc to do that. They can have LaRue do that. And also he covers wing and fullback. And Villemser as well. Perfectly Vilemser, comfortable. Yeah. The worry is, as you say, scrum off. Everywhere else they can fill in, they can work with, they can deal with. I feel like a bit like four years ago, the first half is going to be very cagey. I'm probably not going to see a lot of stuff happening, you know? Yeah. Potentially trialers at most one, maybe two tries at m- most, but that feels ambitious. And we're going to see both teams probably have a similar approach and want to open things up a bit in the second half and wear the opposition down. I reckon South Africa will be looking to do that through finally getting on top of the forwards due to their, you know, changing their entire pack. And New Zealand probably were looking to tire them out and open them up and look to play, you know, more expansive and finally get a bit of a nudge. I wonder if the 7-1 changes how New Zealand play as well. I think as much as anything, it you know, Ian Foster hasn't named the team yet as we speak. We don't know if he had decided on the team or decided on the bench before seeing that they'd gone 7-1. And he certainly hadn't finalised all tactics beforehand. So I wonder if that changes how New Zealand approached the game. I'm assuming that we're going to see the All Blacks play pretty similarly to how they played last week. But yeah, I'd imagine that... In terms of the All Blacks' attack, they're going to look much more expansive. They're going to look wide to wide, look to get the ball into Will Jordan's hands and Mark Zelaya's, if he's playing, hands as much as possible. Um, I'd like to have a quick look at the All Blacks' attack from yes. when they played the Springboks in the Rugby Championship this year. Because the All Blacks put a score on them on that, on that day. And Do you want to know exactly what score they put on them? Go on. 35 points. The last five games between these teams, right? The winning team scored 35 points exactly. Wow. We probably won't see that this week. No, no. That's three games, still. sorry, not five. Still. So here, Moonga sticks the ball in the air and Will Jordan ends up regathering it. Yeah, they pop it to Yuani on the wing and they're immediately in shape. So they've got Scott Barrett rocking over as a one here. And then their overall shape that they've gone into is one three two two. So they've got Barrett there as the one. They've got, I think that's Lomax there, Retallic and Savia as the three. And then they've got two groups of two which are playing off ten. So Moonga here in at 10 tells the two outside him to splinter, okay? Tells them that he's, he's going to need them to turn into a three. So you've got here a clear two there and a clear two there. Moonga has given the instruction that Taylor here is going to have to join up with these guys, okay? Because if you look at this, playing off 10, typically you expect that the real threat here is probably De Groot here or even Taylor punching into this hole here, looking to get on probably the inside of Lucan Yuan. Or even, in fact, going really, really wide, maybe to Talea on the edge, or Barrett one out from the edge. Instead, though, Moonga hits Frizzell on the short ball, just to try and engage the short defence as much as possible. You look at this, and naturally you go, oh, bloody, it's one, two, three, four, five, six on two. You know, they should just go through the hands. But actually, it's not that simple. Sometimes the easiest way to make it look that simple is to just attack a defender when... You're looking for one-on-ones. Shannon Frizzell wants a physical one-on-one battle where he can do damage to somebody and potentially hit them in the face. So yeah. that is exactly... Hopefully on a rugby pitch this time. Yes. That is exactly what Frizzell does there. He hits, I think that's Quaker Smith out the way, it gets the offload in, and immediately... So Cody Taylor then scans and goes, where do I need to be now? Because we're broken shape and that's completely fine. So... In theory, South Africa do quite well to shut off the edge, as South Africa often do this um, shoot-up. Lukanyu Yuan forces Moonga to go back inside, uh, which you think is a good thing, but Taylor is so switched on to the potential of changing groups, as is De Groot up here, that immediately they're over the ball, they've gotten rid of Quagga Smith, and the ball is lightning fast. They then j- just go to an edge and make loads of headway up there. So... My point is, New Zealand are the most equipped team for breaking up a game, improvising an attack, and playing over several phases in the world, even against a team who are as good at slowing the ball down as South Africa, and that's probably what they're going to be looking to do to New Zealand. Yeah, that forward pack are extremely streetwise when it comes to changing plan on the fly, to Mm. attacking in different zones of the field. This is the interesting thing, right? Is the All Blacks over this tournament have adopted a version of the Eddie Jones position this rugby that he was working on with yeah. England? Obviously, saw them come unstuck in that last ten minutes of twicking them last year, where they ended up in a draw and again then in complete control of because suddenly it clicked for England, right? What we've seen them since is move towards that idea, and it's not quite exactly the same, but like it's moving in that direction. It's not a million miles away where they're changing and breaking their groups up on the fly. 
And it's not quite as extreme as what Australia were trying to do this year, which wasn't working, you know, because they hadn't given them the, the Nesso prep time and the space and they didn't have the platform to be doing it. The All Blacks do. Yeah. And what we're seeing instead of this kind of like slightly watered down version that is actually much more effective than full strength. <laughs> Yeah, like you look at say Japan from 2019, right? Mm. They played the most stringent one three two two. Like you are always in this formation. This is just how we play. Whereas I think this current All Blacks team use it more as a guide because yeah. they've got such a physical, aggressive pack who are so good at handling the ball that they can find one on ones for Shannon Frizzell mm. where he can offload. You know that they can find one on ones for Adi Sabir, who's you know not only one of the best carriers in the world, but one of the best just open field runners. The other interesting thing the All Blacks do, though, and we saw this in the Jordi Barrett try against Argentina, is they are unafraid to just line their backs up and to yeah. run shape of their backs instead. And so, like, that try comes from just having, like, straight hands down the line to Rico Ioani. And Argentina are not expecting that out of their own 22. You know, out of the All Blacks' own 22. And they managed to make enough ground, you know. Ioani then makes it up to halfway, almost gets an offload in, and they keep playing out. And New Zealand organised for the entire 15 as the focus rather than the split forwards and backs approach that the position as rugby thing that Eddie Jones were talking about was still doing because you're still fundamentally thinking of forward groups and plays out the boot, right? You're using the building blocks of modern rugby and just restructuring them all, right? The All Blacks instead are taking the building blocks of modern rugby and just putting them next to each other in different combinations constantly yeah. rather than trying to tear them up and you know work on them constantly. And so some of the stuff they do looks really old school like there was one of the Will Jordan tries it looks so old fashioned, but actually it's just them bringing things back around a bit like what South Africa did four years ago, except with attacking rugby with backs rugby rather than forward rugby, right? In just how does this thing work that worked in the nineties or the eighties? How does it work now? What do we need to change or to make it work now? What needs to be done in order to make it work into modern defense? How do we take out the fail saves that other teams defenses have? The interesting thing about Argentina game though, is going over all the tries the All Blacks scored in the first half and the start of the second half, the kind of first 50 odd minutes, right? Because I think everything after that point, Argentina's basically given up. Rugby is such a fundamentally emotional game that once you know you've lost a game, particularly in a game where you're manically pumped up as there if you're Argentina, once you're deflated like that, every tackle is 10% lighter, Every time you're getting on the floor, it takes you ten percent longer once your emotion's gone from it. And you know, so suddenly it's kind of bullshit to look over and analyze too much for the last kind of section of that game, right? But the ones they scored in the first half would not be scored against South Africa, not because of just like oh South Africa got better defense, well, obviously they'd stop it or they make this tackle or whatever, but just because of how they defend the system. All of those tries, because of how analysis focused New Zealand have been since Joe Schmidt came in, particularly in this World Cup, where every single game they've been so switched on to what the opposition do in defense and attack and just knowing exactly how to cancel it out. We saw it against Ireland is the best example. We saw them running attacks that were very specifically targeted at the fact that Argentina like to, and this is something Sinti's become very good at at this tournament, is kind of like triple job off the 13 and 12 two centers work incredibly hard and they kind of start on one man and they work out and then they work out and then they work out and they want to push out right and the winger is likewise kind of starts narrowing it's kind of a fail safe for the two centers who do most of the work defensively like they're so built around the centers defensively and we saw for a team as aggressive in midfield as argentina are using run plays that really targeted getting those two out of the game so will jordan's first try is so simple because New Zealand just run three boots. They're on the short line on the pick and go. They go out the back once. They go out the back again and hit Mwanga, who's in the middle. And he throws it over the top because what they're baiting is Sinti and Chocobares to be watching. They're going to, okay, they're going to triple job. They're going to work up from the first guy. They're going to work onto Mwanga. Then they're going to work onto Barrett, who's at the back of him. They realize they don't need to do that. They've only done two of them. And they don't have the time to then split off and it's gone over the top to Will Jordan who scores in the corner. That won't be the case against South Africa because South Africa have the winger shoot in rather than being a fail safe option. So the winger shoots in and the two centers then drift out. And yes, yeah. they're aggressive, but like they would probably just let the ball go back to Barrett and then tackled him rather yeah. than trying to be aggressive and stop it early. What's really good about Jesse Creel is he often makes half of his decisions in defense while the ball is already in the air. Like yeah. once the passer has let go of the ball, He's so good at reading where that's going to go and making a split second decision and getting into that position, right? Yeah. My kind of counter question to that is Is the only way that the All Blacks can counter that is by getting both him and a winger on the floor? I don't know, though. Right. So, something we saw the All Blacks do in 2019 when they played the Springboks was when they played them in the European Championship before that, they did not do a single attacking kick. Every kick was to exit. 
in the entire game. They then played them in the Rugby World Cup in the opening pool game. And suddenly they set an awful lot where they set a phase in midfield and then they go directly behind to Mwanga or Barrett, who would hang a cross kick to, you know, usually Seferi Reese or George Bridge, who would take it, you know, Aldi Surveyor once as well. And, you know, would make massive ground because they were forcing, you know, forcing players up in different positions. We saw them hold that back and deliberately run plays in the games they played before that tournament in order to bait them into falling for this. And into thinking New Zealand don't think a chip is an option. Don't think a kick is an option. So that game at Twickenham, I think, is the least New Zealand have done analysis of any game this year. I think they basically went in whatever they'd done in the rugby championship and South Africa sort that out. And they're like, well, this is, you know, we sorted out the things they targeted last time and you didn't do nothing else because anything they had on the Springboks otherwise, they were going to save back for the World Cup itself. But I think that game was basically a hit out and they were like, well, it would have been nice to win it, but I don't think they're that fussed by that game at all. Where that game in the rugby championship, we saw there's one try where they pull back to Barrett who does similar thing, midfield cross kick to Jordan who scores. Uh, we talked about the try a lot in the video on it, on video on the All Blacks, rather. I think we might see similar things. I think we might see the All Blacks look to kick an awful lot offensively. I think that's something that could really work here, particularly with the way they love that, like, two out. They pull it back, pull it back to Barrett, Bowden Barrett, who does the cross kick. Yeah, um, or Jordy. Jordy does it as well. Yeah. They have so many, like, astute kickers in that back line mm. that they often use kicking as an attacking tool. You look at, again, against South Africa in the Rugby Championship, Shannon Frizzell scored that try from them going for the kick over the top. Yeah. And they've they've pulled that out against Ireland a couple of times in this World Cup. And I, I think that's going to be a part of it. I also think, like, just the aerial game, like, they're going to like yeah. stick it in the air loads and get loads of competitions between Cheston Colby and Will Jordan and see if they can catch South Africa on the back foot. Because England succeeded in that last week. Yeah. The All Blacks will probably look at that and go, oh, we can do exactly the same thing. This is the other interesting thing about the game for the Rugby Championship, though, is New Zealand exited primarily, as you showed in that clip, through bomb, right? Yes. For hanging it in the air because they know South Africa drop everyone deep or everyone really narrow, and they kind of had a, a a dead zone in between, which they yeah. really targeted. A, South Africa going to have to try and close that up, so they might change how they stand in the backfield. B, the entire time we do get any kicking exchanges, South Africa got to watch out for Bowden Barrett who is a completely yeah. different prospect to everyone they faced this World Cup. Because when they play generally, right? So Freddie Stewart, incredibly good on the high ball. Hugo Keenan covers every blade of grass brilliantly and very capable in all other areas. But Bowden Barrett is the best kicking fullback in the world. And he's yeah. also electrically quick, one of the best attacking fullbacks in the world, if not the yeah. best. And probably the best at covering kicks in the backfield. Like the amount of yardage he can cover. In, uh... I think behind only Keenan. Yes, Hugo Keenan's obviously next level, isn't he? And obviously Fred Stewart is up there, but that's a yeah. conversation for another day. It's interesting you mentioned kicking exchanges because I think we will see a few of these. I think it's fascinating because these two teams in those sort of scenarios do kick quite differently. You know, South mm. Africa, above all, just want loads of length on their kicks, right? They don't care if the opposition are going to mark it in the 22. You know, they can catch it on the five meter line, call the mark, whatever. Uh, as long as it doesn't go dead, they just want the kicks to go as long as possible, right? Mm. The All Blacks, on the other hand, kick more, hoping for the ball to bounce, hoping that it will eventually end up with them having a counter-attack opportunity, you mm. know, that they can eventually run it back and get a broken field in front of them. So they send these like long and low and hard kicks. Bowden Barrett loves these up the sidelines to try and engage South Africa and see if, you know, they can then get Bowden Barrett an opportunity to just crash it up or mm. find Adi Sa Savir in there or whatever. I can't quite call how those are going to go. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing, isn't it? We saw... Argentina get a great deal of success actually and you don't think about it because the thing the scoreboard doesn't reflect 22 entries but if it <laughs> did Argentina were really successful in this matter of kicking long putting the All Blacks back into n 22 and because the All Blacks were then generally clear in field and Argentina could just run it back in a straight line and generally they get up to about the 22 and that's something South Africa can look to emulate that potentially opens chances as well as drop goals we talked about it a lot last week on the England preview but there's a decent chance that we see South Africa looking at drop goal drills because that might be the best way to try and eke out a score here. Last time it was in an England context, but we talked about that setup for when they played the All Blacks last World mm. Cup. That setup for the Pollard drop goal with Leroux on the blind side. They've they've pulled it out once and never returned to it. Yeah. I, I can't help but wonder why. Like they didn't pull it out in the World Cup final. Maybe they would have if the game was tighter with ten minutes to go. They would yeah. have pulled out something like that, but. Now they have another chance to do something like that. And granted, I'm talking about something from four years ago here, but I just can't help but feel like they have somebody who has 50 plus metre drop goals in their locker, in their team. Mm. And they're not afraid to just settle down, take as many three points as possible and 
do what boomers would call boring rugby and just go like what grind out a world cup that way they're not afraid to go for that and i think they won't be afraid to do that on saturday last time these two teams met in a final how was it decided late drop goal indeed george stransky indeed could we see a similar thing again because the other prospect i want to throw out right the last time these two teams played in the final it went to extra time yes it did the only Rugby World Cup final to ever go to extra time at the time of recording? Well. 2003. Oh, yeah. Duh. Uh, also decided by a drop goal. Yep. But that is a, a real possibility. Yeah. I mean, I know my opinion on this. Which team do you think that would benefit? South Africa. Yeah, me too. Um, for, because of the bench split and the minutes the managed? Split. Yeah. Uh, however, I also think the All Blacks have the bullshit factor. More than they any other team in this World Cup, other than France. Like, those are the two most dangerous teams for Africa to play, I think, because both of them can produce a try out of nowhere against literally anybody. And we can't understate what a massive factor that is. Like, yeah. we've, you know, like we've talked more about South Africa on this, but that bullshit factor does make up for so much mm. that they do have so many players who are just capable of randomly scoring a try in a game they're not even in, you know? Yeah. Like, we can't understate how good these guys are. So the Will Jordan, obviously, one more try to break the record for most try by a man in a World Cup. Uh, Portia Woodman still way on top. You know, one's (laughs) got eight tries in a single game in a Rugby World Cup. Never mind eight in a tournament. No, Um, she's twice done that. She's twice done that. What a player, man. Um, So Will Jordan, obviously, looking for that one. You've got Rico Ioani as well, who's been phenomenal at 13. Um, I think that Ireland game was maybe the best game he's ever played. Yeah. I thought he was unbelievable. He's really uh, coming to his own, hasn't he? Yeah. yeah, defensively, and also just like as a ball player, he's yeah. now a, a genuine, and incredible threat. The really interesting thing that's happened this tournament is as a jackal threat. Yeah. He's become a realistic jackal threat over this tournament, which he you've seen him do once or twice before, but like now he is regularly going for it and slowing ball down as well as winning turnovers, which has been a huge element and addition to his game. But yeah, because I think there's one other bullshit fact that we haven't talked about. We mentioned him briefly, but... Ardi Surveyor. Yes. If Ardi Surveyor is as good this week as he was against Ireland, I think the All Blacks win. Yeah. And I don't see no, a world in which they don't. I can't, no, I can't see them not winning if Ardi Surveyor is at his best. What really impresses me about Ardi Surveyor and particularly how the All Blacks use him is he's not only equally good as an edge forward or as a tight forward, but he's equally used as those. Like yeah. they managed to engineer positions, hence the whole thing we we're saying earlier about them splitting off uh, their 1 3 2 2 as a guide. Like, he is the person who roams around the pitch the most. They give mm. him the freedom. He is essentially a back in the way he plays. He's he's like a fly half who doesn't have to pass the ball, you know? Yeah. He's like if the fly half's main job was to carry. And that becomes such an interesting prospect, right? Because you can't analyze and look for it. You've got to be scanning from every phase of where Surveyor's going to be involved. Here's a question for you. Do you think they're going to like send somebody after him to like target him, like laser target him man for man? I don't think you can afford to. No, I don't think you can. But I, I think if have... you did... If you did that, right, you're letting Mwanga and Barrett run free. Yeah. If you're having piece after toy, because it's that's probably who it would end up being as the fittest member of that pack and the most able and you know, physically able to match him. Because you can't send a back after him. It's gotta be yeah. it's gotta be a, a, a forward. It's gotta be somebody who can be. match his physical. It's him or Khaleesi, strength. right? And you don't want to be yeah. taking Khaleesi out of the game like that. So it'd be yeah. piece after toy. Uh you're then no longer putting that level of pressure on the ten. You're relying yeah. on Etzebeth to put that on. Because that's Dutoy's point... main selling point, isn't it? Is that yeah. he loves running at tens and he's the best in the world at it. But the thing is, they use Moster and they use Etzebeth to fly up on ten a lot. But the moment they're out the game, right, and it takes one phase to take those out of the game, suddenly you've got Barrett and Mowanga running free because you're trying to target yeah. Surveyor. Um, I don't think that works. I think you've just got to let and trust your players to manage Surveyor. So question that you, you may not know the answer to, because mm. I don't, is there physically... Away in the world, is it physically possible to stop Ardi Savir when he's playing his best? What no. can you physically do? No, you can't do anything. You can't do anything. You just got to try and play at your best. Um, you can't cancel them out, right? Ardi Savir, at his absolute best, is genuinely unplayable. Yeah, I think Ardi Savir on his best day is better than any other player on their best day in the world. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Like, and I mean, Evan think... Bet's right up there. Like, but... yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but yeah, Ardi Savir, like one thing that I was going to say, and I've already thought of the counter to it in my head, is like you kick to him on first phase or, you know, off kickoff or whatever. Yeah. You try and get the ball to him early and get him on the floor. But the thing is, that doesn't work because 
Look, half his breaks are made from those situations where you've got an easy first up tackle on. The him. other thing is, right, he will be out of the game for what, 10 seconds? Yeah. He's so quick at reloading and just getting back into position and back into shape. Yeah. And getting into a genuinely like credible threatening position, you know, outside 10 usually. Yeah. Yeah. Or reloading onto the wing, taking any position he can, you know, filling in on someone's short side. He's such a good dummy runner as well now. He is. Uh, yeah. Which is something he wasn't a few years ago. Like, and also, like, on the clean out, dummy lines now. Yeah. Like, he can win one man rucks. You know, yeah. it's no surprise that he comes from like a sevens background because like he is so good at that stuff. Like he can, mm. you know, individual one man tackles, one man rucks, you know, at the line out, the, the whole thing. He can do it. He can win this game on his own. Yeah. Yeah. And can slot anywhere into the back row, can play any of their roles as well, which is the important. He can thing. play he any position. Any man. So this is something I wanted to bring up, right? In the rugby championship, we saw the All Blacks run this ploy where they would occasionally bring a po- full pod of three or four forwards round to a short side, literally like five metres, and run a full phase, like out of nowhere, at just a winger on their own, right? And we saw it work incredibly well against Australia and incredibly well against South Africa. They ran it, I think, twice, maybe once against France in the opening game, and have benched it since. We haven't seen it since once. I didn't see it against Ireland, didn't see it, you know, against Argentina, didn't see it even against Italy when they really targeted that. Or maybe you saw it against Uruguay once, I think. Um, but still, you know, it's been something that's largely been a nice for them. Since it worked against South Africa before, I wonder if they bring it back or they look at that as a decoy. They look at that as something, you know, South Africa are looking for and may cause them to load the blind side heavily every phase, keeping a forward there, allowing you to look wider. Um, because if you're leaving a forward on the blind side every single time because you're aware that they might bring Surveyor around at any moment, right? And Surveyor's good enough that he can ride a tackle and pop inside and outside if suddenly he's got three players around him rather on a short really side and only one-on-one yeah. on one tackle. Um, that's a really useful way to use him if you're the All Blacks. Yeah. Um, even and if like they run talk- it once in the first 10 minutes, right, that then changes the prospect because suddenly South Africa going, right, okay, we'll leave Detoya, we'll leave Mostert on the short side to mark watch for that just in case they bring Surveyor around the short side. That's a huge difference, side. isn't it? Yeah. And you talk suddenly- about like Argentina loving to attack off edges, right? The All Blacks do not mind attacking in shorter yeah. uh, open sides, like shorter spaces. The South African defence, when it's at its best, it f- covers the full width of the pitch. They don't leave any wide space outside. And they want the two wingers as wide as possible. So they've basically got views from the crowd of how the attack is setting up. So they can shoot in and pincer in and kill an attack, right? That only happens if the players around the ruck start to space out and spread out equally. Suddenly, if you take a guy out and you put him on the blind side, you're putting Mostert, say, on the blind side... You don't have him in the middle if you've got like a line here. You don't have him in the middle here, meaning that Pollard is in here in that position. You then can't space your forwards out as much. You can't space the wing out as much. And suddenly you've got more space out wide on the other side than you would have for the fact because the South Africa's been so built around everything being like one cohesive system. Disproportionate effect if you're moving Mostert to always be watching the blind side. Then if he's just not in normal position, you can put the two wings right on the extremes. We do need to quickly talk about the breakdown as well. Yeah. Like how that's going to go. Sam Kane played the absolute game of his life against Ireland, mm. um, was just turning over absolutely everything. Well, this is the thing. I think the All Blacks are going to look to take the breakdown out of it as a prospect. The All um, Blacks will, you think? Yeah. We've seen from their own perspective, from their own attack. Okay, yeah. We've seen France do this incredibly well, where they do at most one-man rucks, but often they just have them carry on their own into isolated defenders, usually using offloads as a means of doing that. Yeah. So that you're going one on one and you have to just bring Dupont in and he can get the ball or out. Or just like rolling the ball across the floor to Dupont, sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, you just release it, you pop it up, you as it just roll it backwards, whatever. Just to avoid it so you can have as many men on their feet as possible to attack. Um some of the red roses start to do as well quite well in women's rugby. Um of just like trying to put as few players into the ruck as possible. Black Ferns are really good at that last year as well, actually. It was a big factor in that World Cup win. Um I wonder if we might see New Zealand men. The, the all blicks, as they call them, um, start to do so. Well, no, they have started to do a bit like that, where they try and work as quickly as possible using one man clear out as large as you pile up with Scott Barrett. Um, big part of why Scott Barrett comes to the forward as much as he has, because he's so good at a one man clear out. Yeah. Like Shannon Prezel, Ali Savir, Sam Kane, these guys all can do that. Luckily, you said that you can't answer that question. We know a guy who can in Joe Smith. Yes. Yeah. I think you're going to bring him in as a guest there. No, but. Like, if there is one person who is equipped to knowing how you actually break down this South African defence mm. and score tries, like, several tries past them, it's Joe Smith. Like, there's a world in which New Zealand do score, like, four or five tries in this game. Yeah. Well, so do you want an interesting stat? Go on. You may not expect. So, obviously, we talked about how this is one of Ropey's great rivalries, one of the most even games possible. 
The last five games between these two teams have been decided by more than 10 points. Uh. But they've swung back and forth. Yeah. So you've had three wins for South Africa, two for New Zealand, but all by significant margins. That's very much the vibe ahead of Saturday, isn't it? The, mm. It's so impossible to call, but not necessarily because like these teams have played equally well through the tournament. Just like It just feels like I don't know which style of play is going to be get on top of the other one. Like yeah. I don't know what the the matchup is in terms of oh yeah this really suits South Africa or this really suits New Zealand. I can't call that. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for tuning I... in. <laughs> <laughs> so this is I met uh, Claire Thomas, commentator, friend of the channel, legend, hero. Um, before the South Africa England game, and we were saying this just like the point. The thing about predictions, right? People talk about predictions, but. At the end of the day, we don't know. We just don't <laughs> know anything. It's like bloody it's Roy pointless. Kent in Ted Lasso resigning as a pundit. And like ultimately, we just don't know. And all we can do is talk about how the teams might play and what might work. But we don't know anything at the end of the day. And, and we like, certainly don't know anything. Oh, God, I know literally nothing. I know literally nothing. This is a fixture of so much history that this would be a huge game separate to it being a World Cup final. It is also a World Cup final. It is the <laughs> most even and difficult to call game of the entire tournament for me. Big game, I, isn't it? Yeah, I can see, as I say, both teams winning by 10 points. I can see it being three points either way. I can see it going to extra time. I can see an extra time. I can see it having less time it. in it. I can see it yeah. finishing at the 50th minute. But I can see a world if this does go to extra time, right? In which Will Jordan scores two tries and the All Blacks win by 50. I can also see a world where it's like a late Pollard drop goal, exact mirror to um, 1995. I can also see a world in which like Colby pops up and it's identical to the 2019 and Colby scores a try or he skins Moanga. Um, I can see basically any world happening yeah. in this game. I can see a world in which South Africa win by 50. I can see one where the All Blacks win by 50. I can see one where neither team scores any points at all. I can it's see one where Mark Talea to inexplicably game. plays hooker for the full game yeah. and throws on the lineup backwards. Like anything can happen. I can't think of it. And people talk about, you know, as we said at the start, but people talk about perhaps this is a boring final. This is the most unpredictable World Cup final I can think of ever seeing. Ever. I suppose 2003 is the last time you got to go back to like a really even final that could go either way. Well, if you're yeah. Clive Woodward last year. Before we finish, I think there's one other thing I want to bring up. So we talked quite a bit about Ardi Surveyor. Yeah. Um, we talked a little bit about Bowden Barrett, who this will probably be his last game for the All Blacks, um, which would be oh, a really sad. fitting way for him to go out. But yeah, yeah, he's going to Japan after this. He's going to take a sabbatical at least. And he may come back after that, but you know, he's in his 30s. I'd really miss Bowden if he goes. Yeah. I'd really miss him. Um, but the other guy that we're looking at the end of a career for. I mean, Dwayne Vermeulen for South Africa is amazing he's got this far. Um, but in the sixth jersey, running out as captain, in his autobiography, Sia Khaleesi says he intends to retire after the 2023 Rugby World Cup from playing for the Springboks. And he's going to play rugby for a few more years afterwards. Then he's going to call it a day and focus on just being inspirational and incredible <laughs> and unbelievable. And you know what? He's been doing both alongside for a long time very, very well. Um if Sia Khaleesi wins on Saturday, and I don't mean the coin toss, I mean the full game, <laughs> I am going to say this. I think he deserves to be remembered as the greatest captain in rugby history. I was hoping you'd say that because I, I had this thought earlier on. Like, he is kind of the perfect leader. Yeah. Like, he has such a level of care for, like, all of his mates. Like, he's a good mate. That, I think that's, that's yeah. the thing above all. Like, his teammates are all so, like, looked after by him he takes so much responsibility on himself for just anything yeah. like um and also like he's so unselfish he's not he's not carried the ball since the 43rd minute of the island game yeah. uh, that was when Cicalisi last carried a rugby ball in a game um because he's so focused on doing the unselfish jobs and just clearing out the ball and letting and he's the been unbelievable are, yeah he's been incredible but he lets the people who are better carriers than him who of which there are a fair few in that South African mm. pack he lets them do that because he's better at other things he's just what a player. And this is the thing. We can talk about him as a player. He's an unbelievable rugby player. He's one of the best rugby players in the world and yeah. has been for a long time. You know, you're going back maybe seven or eight years of him being top five, certainly back rowers in the world, probably top 10, top 15 players in the world. Um, he's been incredible for a very, very long time. And he was always a very good, very worthy springbok before that, you know, right back from his first cap against Ireland. Um, but the thing that separates Sia Khaleesi I think from other captains, even from Richie McCall, is his sheer empathy. Yeah. It's 
how he is, as you say, as a person, is the fact that he's used everything he went through, everything he fought through his entire life to get into this position. It's turned right? him into a symbol. Yeah, exactly. But not only that, not only that, he's used that. And I've talked about this before, but I'll say it again. And I'll say it every day until until the world forgets the Akhilesi, which I think for as so long as we play, as so long as rugby is played worldwide, people won't. And I think Sia Khaleesi will live beyond this game. I think Sia Khaleesi will grow to be a figure who is more important than rugby. And at the moment, I think he is that. I think he, he is. is a figure who is more significant than rugby and shows what sport in general can provide to society, um, particularly in South Africa, but worldwide, really. Um, is the fact that he took everything he went through and everything he had to live through and his entire life now hardly had to fight to get here. And instead of going, well, actually, no, I had to fight hard than everyone else. He went, no, everyone had to fight their own level of hard, you know? The when he talked about um Francois Lowe coming from a family where he was expected to play for the spring box, he wouldn't have failed if he didn't. He understood the pressure based on that because for him the pressure was not being able to eat if he didn't play well in rugby and get into, you know, better schools and keep performing. But he understood the pressure affected him in the same way. The way that he's gone out, gone about this and understood and brought this team together, this Springbok team, I don't think, would have won two World Cups in a row if they'd appointed a Dwayne Vermeulen or someone else as captain. Yeah, I think it was that appointment. Yeah. Someone back in 2018 when Razzie came in, that was a very good player and experienced Springbok who, who could have taken that mantle. They found the guy who united this team and he's yeah. done so much more for this than Richie McCaw did for that all black team. You know, Richie McCaw was just the best player and he was an incredible captain. He was great at speaking to referees. He was all the technical things you want from a captain. Right. And sure. He was inspirational, but he was inspirational because he was really good. Yeah. See, he was incredible. He's... And like, yeah. the bar is extremely high here. You know, sounds like we're lauding criticism on Richie McCall. We're saying, no, he's the second best rugby captain of all time. Yeah. And I think if Sia Khaleesi wins on Saturday, if the Springboks win on Saturday, that is nailed in. And I will not hear any arguments otherwise. Sia Khaleesi is the greatest captain in the history of this sport. I think that's fair. As you say, Sia Khaleesi is more than rugby. And he also is rugby and he's everything rugby should be striving to be and everything rugby can be. Yes, and rugby values. When Yeah, but that's the thing, right? You talk about rugby values and you talk about the bollocks around it and all of you know, the Beaumont pushing it as whatever and being the defining thing of the sport. Oh, well, but the thing ultimately, that most at the World Cup final is togetherness. Ultimately, though, at the end of the day, right, the reason this sport matters is because it is because it does matter. It's because mm. people care and people invest emotion in it and people have to see themselves through it and people have to come together through it. And ultimately, right, we can talk about the tactics, we can talk about everything else. If your team isn't united and emotionally together, it doesn't work. And it's part of why I love rugby is because the emotion plays such a bigger part of it than it does in so many other sports. We're trying to push down and suppress your emotion. In rugby, you have to be emotional, otherwise you won't be any good. You know, unless you're a goal kicker, it's the one exception. But you've still got one position where like you need to balance it differently to the rest of the team. And that's incredible. And I love that. And Khaleesi understands that and gets that and personifies that better than anyone else in the history of the game. And I love him. And I don't know, man, like it'd be an incredible story if the All Blacks win it. It'd be an incredible outcome. And they've been a hell of a team and they've formed incredibly well over this tournament. But the sight of Sia Khaleesi lifting a second World Cup would be something else. It really would. We've got two hella emotional teams coming here for the spirit of rugby, of togetherness, of camaraderie, of values and friendship and respect. Um, what an occasion for our what great occasion. sport. What an occasion. Saint-Denis, Paris, 9 p.m. local time kickoff, which is too late. I've said it all tournament. 9 p.m. is too late for a kickoff, but there we go. We may do a live stream sometime between over this weekend. Um, we'll work that out. If there's something goes up saying live stream at this time, or it just pops up saying the Squid Rugby's gone live, that's happening. Um, otherwise, we'll see you on the other side when we know who's won the 2023 Rugby World Cup. The video on next week's game will go up on the Sunday. Yeah, on the 5th of November, Sunday evening. We'll put it live then. We'll do a live premiere and everything as we did four years ago. And we'll dig in deep. We should be able to use footage by that point as well. World Rugby, Bill Beaumont should have gone to sleep for a long nap for four years. <laughs> so we'll see you then. Because I don't know, man, I'm excited. I'm excited. We're going to a World Cup final. We sure are. Us. We sat separately because we couldn't get two tickets together. But like, we're both going to a World Cup final. I, this is like the biggest thing on my bucket list and we're doing it on Saturday. I'm very excited. It'll be an honor to be there. Just watching people react, those coaches, people reacting in South Africa to the semi-final. It'll be such an honor to be there for whoever wins it, you know, because the same thing will be happening in New Zealand. Same side yeah, New Zealand. Out of New like, Zealand. I'm happy for those guys after yeah. they've been written off. And 
reading stuff from fans and you know not a lot of english fans a lot of french fans saying the competition's just gone quiet um Walsh fans obviously saying like, yeah, obviously the pubs are packed on Saturday in Cardiff. <laughs> you can't get into a single pub to watch it. Obviously, it's Cardiff. What are you expecting? But otherwise, you know, I think a lot of the world is quieting down the World Cup fever, particularly here in France, um, since France got knocked out. But in New Zealand, in South Africa, it is the biggest show in town. It's the biggest thing in the world, and everyone's going crazy for it. And I can't wait to see how whichever team that wins reacts. That's the thing I'm most excited for, is seeing the fans, seeing the reaction, seeing the whole deal around it. Because it's going to be special. You know what it's going to be? Rugby. You're goddamn right.